Good morning, everybody. Um, I decided to cover a topic that we haven't talked about in a little while, and it's uh, urologic issues in pregnancy. Um, specifically, what I'm going to cover is some physiologic changes that we see in the pregnant patient, um, issues around imaging the pregnant patient, stones in pregnancy, and then a unique case that, I'm gonna, that I saw down at St. Paul's that we'll talk about at the end. So, what do urologists see? They see hydronephrosis, and physiologic hydronephrosis is seen in 90% of pa uh, pregnant patients. It doesn't appear, or it appears at about six to ten weeks, and doesn't resolve till about four to six weeks postpartum. It was thought that generally this is caused by progesterone, um, but it, in looking at the literature, it seems that it's due more to the compression of the uterus, and this is thought to be often because that in, in patients uh, with urinary diversion you don't see any dilation. The right side is more commonly affected than the left. Uh, this is thought to be due to dextro rotation of the uterus as well as engorgement of the uterine vein on that side. As well, the left ureter is protected by the, the sigmoid. As well, we see a 30 to 50 percent increase in GFR and renal plasma flow. Um, and the normal ranges for creatinine uh, specifically are 25% lower, and you have an increased renal size. The metabolic changes we see are going to sort of what leads into my talk about the, the stone portion of the talk, and uh, these patients do have increased urinary calcium excretion due to absorptive hypercalciuria, as well they have uric acid excretion, but they also have increased urinary inhibitors, specifically citrate and magnesium, and they have a good urinary output. So, the incidence of stones in pregnancy is actually the same as in the non-pregnant patients. It's about 1 in 1,500, despite these increases in uric acid and urinary calcium. But it's still the most painful and non-obstetric reason for hospitalization of the pregnant patient, and it's one that all of us sort of encounter between women's and St. Paul's. So how do we diagnose these patients? You know, usually they come to light where you're getting a strange phone call at some strange time and you're convinced that it's probably just the baby coming early, but it, often it's not. Um, our first line diagnosis still remains to be ultrasound, but only this diagnosis was only about 50% of patients. And in one study by Butler, it showed that only 60% had an ultrasound proven diagnosis in 35 women, which were proven to have stones by other modalities. Principally, that was MRI that they saw it with. So the sensitivity and specificity is not that great. So how do we make this better? How do we better image these patients? Uh, specifically, we can sort of improve on our ultrasound imaging using things like renovascular resistive indices, ureteral jets, as well as vaginal ultrasounds. So renovascular resistance increases in acute obstruction, and neither pregnancy nor physiological hydro should alter your resistive indices. So in the pregnant patient in the study by Shokir in 2000, a change in resistive indices had a 95% sensitivity and 100% specificity and a 99% accuracy in diagnosing acute obstruction. There were two very famous urologists that wrote about Doppler ultrasound, Drs. McNeely and Goldenberg in 1991, and it showed that uh, looking at ureteral jets may increase the accuracy showing the level of obstruction compared to the iliac vessels. And basically, an absence of a ureteral jet on one side in a pregnant patient um, uh, is, is significantly uh, suspicious of obstruction and should be confirmed with changing the position of the patient. Now, the caveat to all this with ultrasound is that you're totally dependent on who your ultrasonographer is, what they're comfortable with doing, and how good they are, and how often they do it. So, the other thing that is that all the radiologists speak about is the use of vaginal ultrasound. And again, this is used for better visualizing the distal ureter. And actually, 100% of stones in the distal ureter with transvaginal ultrasound could be visualized in the Lang study. But this is sort of, once we get past ultrasound, which we know we all use in pregnant patients, we get to sort of the more controversial side of radiology in pregnancy. One thing that I want to talk about and give a bit of reminder of is, is what we measure radiation in, and that's either centigray, milligray, or rad. So for all of you that don't remember, one centigray is equal to one rad, and one milligray is equal to 0.1 rad. So 
the reason why I'm going to be talking about this is the issue around doing CT scans in pregnancy, which is actually quite controversial. The fetus itself absorbs about 40% of the radiation dose delivered to the mother's abdomen. The National Radiologic Protection Board said that the fetus absorbs 0.14 centigrade or 0.14 rads with a KEB and about 0.17 centigrade with a limited IVP. A pelvic CT is about 2.5 rads. So if you guys can kind of keep those numbers in your head, it's going to make the next couple slides sort of put them into perspective as to where the problem lies. It has, yeah, yeah. So Dr. Masterson's question was, was how is a limited IVP only 0 0.03 of a rad more? It has to do with the shielding that happens with a limited IVP. So despite the fact that they're doing three shots, and this is actually one of Dr. Stether's studies, you can actually decrease the radiation by shielding. So as well, this was a tough thing even to determine these numbers because if you look at different places, different machines, you're going to actually get different fetal radiation exposure. So these numbers were actually taken from the Mayo Clinic down in Scottsdale um, with their machines and they use that as a standard. But different places are going to have different numbers. So when is the fetus most vulnerable? It's during the first trimester. It's most susceptible to the teratogenic effects. And the incidence of congenital anomalies doubles at about 25 to 80 centigrade, which is quite a bit higher than the studies that we just looked at, but becomes significant when you're thinking about using things like fluoro. And, you know, they speak in the literature about termination being addressed with exposures like greater than 5 to 10. But the risk of not, like malformations definitely is, is quoted to be increased at 10 centigrade. So, where am I going with this? The National Council of Radiation Protection says that fetal risk is considered to be negligible at 5 rads or less. And if you remember that first slide that I showed you, a pelvic CT was 2.5 rads or 2.2 rads, depending on what you see in the literature. And that really, the Protection Safety Board is saying that you're not going to get any significant changes until you get greater than 15 rads. However, you start looking into other parts of the literature, and specifically one of the more current articles in 2005 says, for conception age uh, greater than 15 weeks, there's a small but measurable increase in childhood leukemia and other cancers for exposures of greater than one rad. All of a sudden, that negates our CT scan. The other thing that they quote as, as having increased risk is IUGR, congenital malformations, even fetal death, depending on how high you get your radiation dose. And specifically, this is at the first trimester. In this study, they quote low-dose, moderate, and high-dose exams. And what they describe as a high-dose exam is any exam that's greater than one rad. So that's including our CT, fluoro, and most of our in interventional stuff. So, the low-dose exams are plain films and, and that type of thing. So, five versus one. Um, I chatted with some of the local radiologists about this, and, and no one would commit. <laughs> um, basically, the decision was, was that a CT scan still uh, exposed the fetus to too much radiation. However, the caveat to that is if the mother was sick, if you needed the imaging to, you know, to see, uh, the stone based on sort of a life or death scenario that, that they would go ahead and do it. So the, the bottom line is that ultrasound is still our first line test. So what's the safe approach if you had a pregnant patient? I guess it's to start with the ultrasound, see what your ultrasonographer can do, consider your um, endovaginal ultrasound and your Doppler and your ureteral jet. Some people say that that doesn't really provide them with much more information at all. At that point, you can move, move to a limited IVP, also sometimes not providing enough information. Um, but the party line in radiology is that the CC, CT dosage is too high. Now, in, in parts of the U.S., they're doing CT. Like I'm, I was speaking with Dr. Teichman, and apparently they're doing CT quite commonly in the pregnant patient down in Texas. But here, that's not the case. The other consideration is MRI. So this is just a reminder to sort of show 
that our problem lies in the, in the exposure of a, of a pelvic CT. Now, pelvic CT is not the same as a CTKUB. However, I couldn't find anything that definitively said fetal exposure for a CTKUB, nor could the radiologist tell me what they thought it, the approximate exposure would be. So what's our gold standard? According to the literature, it's still IVP. It's 0 0.17 rad, and, and like uh, Dr. Masterson was mentioning, how can they keep it low? It's basically um, using abdominal shields uh, with, uh, and with the patient prone to decrease its distance from the actual x-ray beam. And Dr. Stuthers did her study on this, and this is actually a really broadly quoted study. So where does MRI fit? It's radiation free, we're using it more. The drawbacks is, is that the stones are seen as signal voids against high signal urine and it makes small, small stones very difficult to see. And we're still getting used to kind of looking at MRI, so we do, are pretty reliant on our radiologists to help us interpret it. There is ways of optimizing that with high intensity T2 weighted images and they're beginning to do this more. So we'll, I, I suspect we'll start seeing more MRI for stones in pregnant women. So how do we treat these patients? Well, the majority of these patients, 70% um, will pass the stone on their own. Um, in terms of what choices we have, we have our percutaneous nephrostomy tubes, which no one wants a tube hanging out of their side most of the time, let alone when they're pregnant. We have stents and we have ureteroscopy, and I'm going to focus a little bit more on ureteroscopy. So this, um, from a paper in 2004, shows sort of a flow diagram of choices of treatment. And this is also quoted in our most recent AUA update series on, on pregnancy, but it, it essentially shows an algorithm. So you do your ultrasound, you optimize with your resistive indices and transvaginal ultrasound, you do a limited IVU if need be, and you observe. If you need to, and if you're forced to, you can go ahead to stent, do your reteroscopy, or put in a PERC tube. Oops. So percutaneous nephrostomy. It's still useful for those patients presenting with fever and pilo, so the sick patients. It does avoid retrograde instrumentation, but the cons are, are obvious ones. You have a tube in, it can get dislodged, it can bleed, it can be uncomfortable, they need the external appliance, and they can get infections. What about internal stents? Um, well, they can be placed under local. I haven't seen that, but I think it can, it's quoted to be able to be done. Uh, you can use a cone tip catheter to aid in the passage of a guide wire, which can also be done under ultrasound placement. But the con is encrustation, and the stents need to be changed about every four to eight weeks. And this is a real problem when it, with a woman who presents at 20 weeks. The two papers that talked about encrustation, one was uh, Dr. Denstead's paper in 1992. It, had about, it actually had a reasonable number of patients in it, about 30 patients. The other paper that I think probably was the basis for Denson's paper was one written in the New England Journal uh, by a guy by the name of uh, Laughlin in 1986. And it actually was a case report, so I, and I think it led to Dr. Denstead's five-year review, which showed significant incrustation in these patients. And it's something that we have to remember, because if you put this stent in at 20 weeks, you're going to be changing it a couple times before the end. Um, also, stents cause pain. I've taken more stents out, I think, for pain than put, put them in for stones. And uh, hematuria as well as ascending infections. So where are we at with your reteroscopy? Um, pros of this and cons. So it allows us to see the stone. It's definitive treatment. You avoid stent complications. You actually have shorter hospital stays than you do with a stent or a, a perk. But the cons are that often, you know, they need a general. You may or may not have to use fluoro. You can actually get ureteral injury or perforation and induction of labor. So Evans and Wallen in the Journal of Endurology in 2002 reviewed about seven studies that looked at the use of ureteroscopy in pregnant patients. And if you look at the equipment that they're using, you can see that some of them are pretty big scopes that now... You know, we have scopes that are graduated from 6 to 7.5. So um, the majority of these patients, however, had a pretty reasonable stone-free rate. Now, in terms of complications, um, in Alvik's paper, he had one patient with a ureteral perforation and had some premature contractions. The ureteral uh, perforation was actually treated conservatively with the placement of a stent, and the patient went on to deliver at term in a healthy baby. Um, in terms of the premature contractions, again, the patient went on to deliver at term. So, you know, overall, the outcomes looking at these patients is really 
pretty reasonable. So where does, um, where does the laser fit? This is our sort of new, new thing in the mid-90s. And uh, Watterson, and, and again, Dead said, so uh, University of Western Ontario and Edmonton came together to do this study um, in 2002 to look at definitive management in the pregnant patient. Um, they had eight patients and a total of 10 stones because they had some patients with encrusted stents. Uh, the average age was about 22 weeks, and the average size of the stone was actually pretty, pretty big, about 8.1 millimeters. Um, and your procedure success rate was listed to be about 90%. And the conclusion from this paper was that it is a definitive management for failure of conservative treatment in these patients. So this is their sort of collection of patients that they had in this, in this study. And uh, you can see one patient had um, sort of two stones, so distal ureteral calculus and then encrusted stent with a mid ureteral calculus, so they had one on either side. And the majority of them, again, were stone-free. Um, uh, however, there was, I think, two patients that ended up with a stone in their kidney that was then later treated postpartum with litho. As well, they were able to remove the, uh, the encrusted stents. Uh, yep, the average size was 8.1 millimeters. Yeah. So, it, again, a pretty reasonable thing. Now, obviously, the caveat to this is how comfortable are you? How comfortable are you doing your reteroscopy on a pa pregnant patient? What's your backup? Do you have an obstetrician that's down the hall or in the same city or any of that? Do you have a laser? Because these are all things that affect your decision making around doing your reteroscopy on the pregnant patient. Um, several of the other studies discussed doing it under local, being able to avoid a general anesthetic, um, being able to avoid fluoro. I know the ones that I've, the one I did with Ryan, we are able to um, not do fluoro and you know look our way up the ureter uh, with the ureteroscope and basket uh, the stone out due to the capacious nature of the ureter because it's so large. <coughs> As well, um, in Alvik's paper again, I just wanted to mention that even with the complication of a perforation, they were able to stent this patient and still have a term delivery of a normal child. So what are, the con what are listed as the contraindications? In Biani's paper, he listed um, basically any stone greater than a centimeter, and I actually changed this to be stone burden, because I don't know now that was, um, if, if a stone greater than a centimeter would be uh, contraindication. But stone burden, multiple calculi, a transplanted kidney and sepsis is what sort of the testable cancer is for that. Litho and PCNL, we don't do it. Litho is associated with uh, intrauterine and growth retardation, and PNL is because you need significant fluoro time. It's not a great option. All right. So, oh, sorry. I'm just going to let our, yeah. So Dr. Patterson was mentioning that um, there are some case reports of doing a percutaneous nephrolithotomy in pregnancy. Um, but again, these are case reports. And often because you can put the tract in under ultrasound, uh, there isn't significant need for fluoro. And secondly, uh, the majority of patients that he's seen, uh, which are three cases, come pre-stented. And as a result, that increases the capacity of the ureter and the ability to be able to pass your scope um, and av again, avoid the fluoro. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I think the other issue is that the 
Dr. Wright wanted to say something too, so when you're done, Ryan. Can you guys hear them in Prince George? I don't know how I hear if they hear. Okay. Okay. So. Okay, Dr. Wright has a question. So his question. Okay. Okay. So the, his question is: is is there a difference between being invasive and I'm by invasive? I presume you're meaning by ureteroscopy. Yes. Over a stent. Over a stent. Okay. Well, so his question is: what's the benefit over being invasive, ureteroscopy, over placing a stent? If I can say definitively what's been studied, that patients have uh, shorter hospital stays, um, fewer issues with pain, and you get a definitive treatment, i.e. most of the time you're rendered stone free, in which case you don't have the complications associated with stent, being encrustation, pain, hematuria, multiple visits in hospital, multiple admissions, longer stays. Um, but, as you said, stents been the mainstay for a long time. Uh, they do encrust. You may have to change them. But it is still a totally viable option. And if you don't have a ureteroscope and you don't have a laser, that's what you do. Yeah. What are the risks to the fetus? Um, that's what they ask. What, what, what is the risk? Well, in terms of... Yeah. In terms of actual numbers, I didn't couldn't definitively say, okay, you have this much of a risk of causing preterm labor. And when I talked to some of the obstetricians, they wouldn't say that definitively either. In terms of when is the safest term, I'd say it's second trimester, and they all generally agreed with that, depending on how irritated the uterus is. Depends on how much pain they've had, how much, if they've had any fever or other complications associated with stone, and how, if they've had any preterm contractions. But, you know, again, it depends on stone size, if you're going to use the laser, if you're going to, if they already have a stent in place, all these factors come into play. I don't know, Ryan, what, what you definitively well, quote. No, yeah, that's what I got. Right. That's the tone of literature, too. Um, very with the patients that, that I've had tend to be have been hospitalized and they're just sitting in a community hospital mm -hmm. and uh, they can't be sent home because of pain control issues. Right. Uh, and then the other thing is you have a detailed discussion with the patient about how significant the pregnancy is and that you may have a patient who's gone through a three months in being intravenous uh, or in vitro fertilization mm -hmm. and, and has taken years to get pregnant. That's a very precious pregnancy. And so the risk in that patient I feel a lot higher, and you're going to be a lot more conservative in that patient, mm. even though the risk is so small because of the consequences of it something goes on. Okay. Dr. Taylor, you had a question. I was just going to ask what you guys do up in Prince George. So. I think it's an open myth that you call it very late, but in this century. Mm -hmm. um, I've never seen a report of it, and it doesn't happen as far as I'm concerned. Um, the scope is used in six French, mm -hmm. then five percent. Mm -hmm. I do them all in the local anesthetics. You just mm -hmm. need to dilate them with number eight cones of catheter. Mm -hmm. You never use it the, the stones are soft. Mm -hmm. That's one of the easiest you read to do. The stones are always in passive, low down, usually. Mm -hmm. So 
that the other local is here, I don't stand much to it. And right. I, I think everybody's got the equipment now. The only instrument you shouldn't use is the electro hydraulic, which is complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any thoughts from Prince George or Victoria? I think uh, I think I agree with the uh, Yuri Ross with the approach the uh, first approach. I do have a, another question though. Mm -hmm. um, how often do you actually see physiologic and real validation of pregnancy presented with pain, mm -hmm. whether stolen or any other complicated factors? Are you gonna comment on that? A lot. A lot is what Dr. McNeely says. <laughs> Mm -hmm. We see all the consults at women's hospitals because there's no adult urology service there to catch the children. And about uh, once a month we get consults for a pregnant patient with pain, and the industry shows nothing but high pain. And the pain goes away. Did they pass the stone, or was it just high to a pregnancy causing pain? Yeah, and again. Okay, sorry. Okay, Dr. McLaughlin has a question. Oh, oh sorry. Dr. Patterson wanted to say something else. I think the problem here is that the volume is so small. Mm. I mean, I think you can finish the article with eight cases. I know. The volume is very small. More, more of a drag prospect is that this week and it's engaged. I know. I mean, you, you need numbers. And then it's yeah. anecdotal. And I do this, I do that. Yeah. But I think it's very, I mean, you're lying in daily. It's a very emotionally difficult situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, one last thing with Dr. Patterson, and then I'm going to move on to the second half here. Uh, I just want to reiterate one of William's comments. Okay. Uh, these stones are often hydraulic appetite when we look at someone else's. And uh, once you engage them with a basket, they often just crumble. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, it's sort of even with the laser, the pressure immediately. It's not a child's monster to want to hydrate. So it, is a, it, is, you know, it, it can be a very simple and quick reroute. Okay, Dr. Madison, did you want to talk to Survey the audience to see what they think of limited sequence IPP from my experience, they think of Or we could survey the audience about the utility of limited sequence IPP in my experience, they've been very poor tests when it comes to healthcare and much small, but your point had very high sensitive specificity in that article. Yeah. No, and, and that's the thing, is that it, I think it speaks to what is considered gold standard based on literature, but not based on experience, and every urologist who I've talked to says they don't even bother. Anyone else? Does anyone do them? Kelowna, Prince George? Or sorry, Victoria, Prince George? Okay, take that as no. All right, so the next uh, thing I want to talk about is, is a patient that we had at St. Paul's with placenta percreta. Uh, this is a. So the question was, you know, if you don't do IVP, what do you do? Anyway, um, this, this uh, oh, okay. One, one last comment, Dr. Ashar, and we will have surveyed the room.
Set up your page like if that's what you were going to do in the next five years. That's kind of your place. Yeah, that's a good point. That MRI is really sort of moving up the moving up the ladder. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Um, I'm getting the go sign. All right. So, placenta procreta. Uh, this is a problem we don't see often, but it is a big problem um, if we do see it in urology. In this case that we had at St. Paul's, we had a 32-year-old woman who was having her second child. She'd had uh, uh, two previous um, pregnancies prior to her, or after her first pregnancy, but uh, they resulted in termination due to malformation. So this was a precious baby. Um, at 25 weeks, um, they could see a placenta procreta on ultrasound, and uh, cystoscopy at 30 weeks did not show any invasion into the bladder, but MRI did. Um, and she came to St. Paul's with a planned elective section at 36 weeks. So I'm going to go through this a little bit. What is placenta procreta? Uh, well, placenta accreta is a generalized term of when the placenta goes on beyond its boundaries of the wall of the uterus. You've also heard terms called increta and percreta. So increta is when it actually grows into the wall and percreta is growing beyond the wall. So Dr. Gorley, this one's for you. Why does it happen? Uh, it's a, a caused by a decidua basalis deficiency and the trophoblastic villi of the fetus. Um, the deciduous basalis in the uterus acts as the stop sign. And uh, when it's not there, the uh, trophoblastic villi just keep growing and grow beyond the wall of the uh, grow beyond the wall of the uterus. So what is the incidence in the literature? About one in 500 to one in 93,000. It's very broad, and again, it depends on uh, multiple factors, multiple risk factors that I'll talk to, uh, talk about. So here's a little schematic of it. So you can see percreta over here on the far right is the smallest number of these abnormalities of the, of, uh, the placenta that you see, but it's actually going beyond that outer wall, and that's where we get involved. So what are the risks? It's associated with previous cesarean section, previous previas, multiparity, increased age, prior DNC, and you can see that patients um, that are high risk are patients so if they've had a previous before, they're at a 10% risk. If they've had a previous in a section, they're at a 25% risk of getting this. And if they've had multiple sections, they actually have a 67% risk of having a placenta per, uh, or a creta. What's the problem with this? These patients bleed. They bleed a lot. In a meta-analysis of 50 patients or 50 cases of per creta, there were only three cases that had less than a three-unit transfusion rate greater than 20 patients in that 50 patient meta-analysis had a greater than 20 unit transfusion rate. Um, the diagnosis, well history, any patient who's had a history of section and gets hematuria should be presumed a procreta until proven otherwise. Um, and pre-delivery ultrasound and MRI can actually show the placenta growing into the bladder and I've got some pictures of that for us to see. Um, in terms of cystoscopy, they talk about a blackberry under the mucosa. So I guess you're seeing dilated uh, venous bundles under the mucosa. I didn't see that. So some people may think this is a big median lobe, but it actually is a, a, a placenta growing into the bladder. And this is a Doppler shot of it so where you can actually see flow. So here's our bladder, and this is the placenta right here. <laughs> I know what you're thinking, Dr. McLaughlin. Um, uh, placenta accreta findings. So MRI finding. This is where MRI has really become to the forefront. So in accreta, your myometrium is thin and indistinct. In percreta, your uterine wall is focally obliterated, and the tissue is iso-intense um, as the placenta comes through the wall. So I talked to the... Um, to the radiologist a little bit uh, and they talked a lot about gadolinium and to use or not use. Gadolinium is something that can pass through the placenta and the, uh, the fetus then breathes it in, pees it out, breathes it in, pees it out. So they try not, they try to avoid gadolinium. But your indications um, are essentially when your ultrasound is non-diagnostic and he said their indications are largely to increase the confidence of the surgeon at the time of the operation because this is a big case. So let's look at a normal MRI. Um, basically, here is your uterus, and you have a nice, round, smooth wall. There's nothing going beyond it. And in this shot, so you, you see baby here in the middle, and there's a nice, smooth plane between bladder. This is bladder down here. So this is a coronal sh or, um, sagittal shot. And then that here is our line of our uterus, so no invasion. 
So placenta procreta MRI, and this is actually pictures of our patient that we saw. So here we go into the bladder. Here's baby over here. And again, here's another shot. So you can see that squiggly little thing in there is actually the start of the placenta invading to the bladder. Now you look at this and you, could, you think you should be able to see that when you look in. But on repeat cysto, all we saw was the indentation of the uterus. So here's another nice shot, again, of our, of our patient. So you can see the, the resolution with MRI in a baby is incredible. But here's our low-lying placenta here. So this sort of... Uh, this thing. There's no plane down here. There's no obvious bladder. Here's a shot here. So placenta, this big thing that looks kind of like a U. Again, sitting low in the, in the uterus. Uh, we'd expect it usually up on the upper wall over here, and it's not. And see all these little black areas down here? I sort of said, oh, well, you know, why are they black? And they said that's because they have a lot of blood flowing through them. So these are dilated veins of the procreta going into the bladder that you can actually see. Okay, so it's going to bleed. Um, so what do you do about it? Um, one thing that the literature talks a lot about is actually using your interventional radiologist to do uh, preoperative uh, intra-iliac um, balloon placement. And they speak in the literature about putting them in the anterior divisions, but in talking to the radiologist, they usually put them prior to the anterior divisions because there can be anterior and posterior collateral flow. So they get them in the internal iliacs. Um, now, they say definitively that there is significant blood loss. When you speak to the people actually operating, um, they sort of say there's a lot of blood either way. So, but it is a thought. So, you know, with these patients with imaging, we have to have a high index of suspicion that with, uh, with previous previa or C-section, and we should use MRI um, for problem cases because it is. It's great imaging, and you could see there that you could actually see uh, the vessels flowing. And we should think of our interventionalists. So how do you get ready for something like this? Chris Hogan and I were down at St. Paul's and we were thinking a lot about that. And uh, you, you prepare. Um, you get a cross match, you get your anesthesia consult, you get your balloon catheters in. The case that was scheduled to go at 8.30 I think went at 1.30 by the time we were prepared enough <laughs> to start this case. We did a preoperative cysto and we got some stents in after much struggling up one side, and I'm really glad that we did because those stents are very useful once you get started. So I've got some good pictures here about what this actually looks like. Um, so this is where they've taken the baby out. Okay, This is our uterus. Here's the bladder. And here is, it's invading into the wall. And you can see it's low and posterior. Okay. Um, here they packed a sponge in the vagina. That's another way of controlling bleeding. So this picture has got a lot of arrows, but basically what it's trying to show is they call it a lower uh, uterine segment diversion, meaning skip the part where it's attached to the bladder and divide everything else first. So you can see that they've taken the pedicles down on the uterus here. Um, and that basically they're going to begin to develop the plane down by the bladder, avoiding this which is the big dilated venous channels of the procreta going into the bladder. Okay, so here's your ureter right here. So this is kind of a nice shot because this is sort of what it looked like. Um, they were pulling the uterus up, and as Dr. McNeely described, it's like trying to operate with a turkey in the abdomen. Um, the bladder is right here. Um, they're beginning to come down and divide these pedicles of the uterine vessels. And here's your procreta. So in the papers, they describe this sort of nice, elegant move of sweeping your fingers beneath the attachments um, between bladder and cervix and developing this plane. I guess that, that, that's in theory what should be happening. And then you begin to divide the vesicle uterine fold, and here's your placental tissue. You've ligated all your lower vessels. Everything's going just fine, supposedly. And so here you actually begin to take the placenta off the uterus, and, and then it begins to look something like this. <laughs> so, um, it was at this point where we decided to proceed with the cystotomy, because actually cutting the placenta off made it bleed a whole lot, and actually at this point is when our patient was on her fifth unit and her pressure dropped to just about nothing. 
and then go backwards. Well, they describe, you know. I know, but the thing is, they've got they've got to get the baby out, a, and they've got to, and they've also got to stop the uterus from bleeding because it's bleeding like sin, right? So it's. Well, they sew it up. They sew it up, you know. But the thing is, is that if you're going to even be, even begin to think of decompressing this whole placenta, you've got to start ligating the vessels. And that's why. And they, but they do describe doing uterine packing. And also, Dr. McLaughlin, you're right. There's multiple ways that, that this has been described in different formats. But they describe this sort of posterior to anterior approach being the least bloody. I think either way to me, it sounds pretty bloody. Krush, did you have a question? Yeah. It is, yeah. And I mean, that's why at that point, I mean, they described sort of this division of actually taking the placenta off. So the question is, you know, do you do the cystotomy earlier or later? Do you start with the opening the bladder right away? And I, I, I mean, that's what I, and in this case, that's what I did is I tried sort of dividing some off. Patient dropped her pressure. She was bleeding. And I just, I opened the bladder, and I think it's the most reasonable thing to do. As to when you do that in reference to taking down all these pedicles of the uterus, most of the literature describes getting complete vascular control of the uterus, leaving only a cu- the cuff attached to bladder and vagina. So this is a picture of what it actually looks like. This is in our patient here, but you see that's actually cuff of vagina there. This whole raw surface is placenta, and I think there's some bladder was attached about at this level, and that's uterus there. So you can see big big thing that you're trying to operate around and uh, <laughs> yeah it must have been this picture in, in Augustine so yeah so the principles are mobilize the bladder identify the vesicle urine of, uh, uterine fold dissect the bladder off if you can at least that's what's described but I, I do agree with Dr. McLaughlin that if it's bleeding too much patient's unstable just open the bladder the problem is once you get there and the bladder's gone and the, the uterus is gone and it's off the vagina, it, you're very low in posterior when you're doing a repair and you're going to be thankful that you have your uh, ureteric stents up because you're going to need them. Um, so in terms of hemostatic control, vaginal packing, uterine packing, as well as pre-op intraarterial balloon catheters are thoughts. Mm, good question. Well, I mean, I, I think that is something you can, Oh, the question is, um, why use balloons? Why not use bulldogs down on the, on the iliac vessels if you can get down there? And uh, I, I think that is definitely a, a something that you can do. The difficulty is, is that you've got this big thing in there, and generally the people who are operating at that time are the gynecologists, and they're principally concerned with, with the baby, getting the baby out, and it's, I, I think it's an approach down to that, um, to that, those internal iliacs that they're not used to. So, Dr. Sullivan? Um, this is a big hope to the situation. The inter- this is a bit of a big hope that this situation that interarterial balloons are going to seriously increase the blood flow in this mass. I think this looks a bit of an area. It is. And it depends on who you talk to. You talk to the surgeons that do it. They say it mm, doesn't make a difference. You talk to the radiologist, and it makes a, makes a big difference. So you can no. <laughs> so you can see. So you can see who's actually in the OR. So you know, the the obstetricians and gynecologists, the ones I talked to about this, they sort of say, well, we do it because we say it's out there to be done. But they didn't think it made a big difference. After five hours, and then you went to operate. What's your opinion of this preoperative preparation? Well, my, in my case of one, I was glad those balloons were there, but I don't know any different. And the thing is, I was happier that the anesthesia had the blood hanging basically at the start of the case. And the more principal thing was... <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I guess I, I want to load the boat, so to speak. No. Yeah, it, it, different. I, again, we asked the gynecologist about this, and it's totally dependent on the patient as to how you go about it. A lot of patients want to have uterine preservation or a partial hysterectomy 
or all these different things. And that's especially when the balloons and the embolization and all that sort of stuff comes into play. You're not limited. You're not limited. As well, you know, we sort of ask them, oh, why aren't you packing the uterus? Why aren't you packing the vagina? And it's, again, very obstetrician dependent as to how you manage this. But that is a choice. And there are papers that talk about conservative management and actually leaving it. So. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to you mean, as to what style of incision to make. Yeah, you're so, going to bring a to it. no, no, that was just that image. So Jeff's question was, what type of incision do you use? You use a midline, just like a radical. Okay, post-operative management, tubes, 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 um, FP tube, hemovac, Foley, ureteral stents. She had all of them. There's no documented timing as to optimal removal, but one thing I did learn is that it, urology has to dictate the removal because I think the gynecologists were going to have them all pulled out on post-op day one. So be careful and leave notes everywhere. So what's the big complication? The bottom line is mortality, 5 to 10% of both the fetus and the mother. But we also did a case, Dr. Gorley and I, on Friday with a vesicle vaginal fistula, which is also a very difficult problem post-percreta. So be prepared. The AUA update series describes the GU bag, and I'm thinking of all, anyone that's going out into practice, presume that you're not going to have anything in the room that you need and go get it yourself. And this is the types of things that they listed in that AUA update. So that's we've come to the end. Um, hopefully I haven't kept anyone too long. But summary in general for this talk is what are three things that I would want you to take away. Uh, ultrasound is still first line for our pregnant patients. Uter ureteroscopy is definitive and it's safe. And I think the tone from the audience, um, as well as from the literature, is that it's an up-and-coming management. It's a reasonable thing to try. Um, but we do always have stents. And up until ureteroscopy and laser, stents was how we managed these patients. And that's still very much a reasonable choice and a safe choice, um, especially if you're, if you're not sure with your ureteroscopy. And in terms of placent or placenta percreta, Key is preparation, um, specifically, you know, getting everyone on board to be aware that this patient is going to bleed a lot. And, uh, and definitely it was the anesthetist that made me feel comfortable in that room. So, thank you. <laughs>